This tape has been produced with funds from the United States Department of Education in a grant awarded to the Department of Linguistics and Interpreting at Gallaudet University. The grant is entitled Interpreter Training for Deaf Individuals. Consecutive Interpretation Practice. The following videotape has been designed expressly for the purpose of providing interpreters and interpreting students with consecutive interpretation practice. There are a variety of speakers on this tape. Each speaker will present a short speech in its entirety. This will be followed by the same speaker giving the same speech with pauses. During those pauses, an interpretation will be presented. This tape can be used in a variety of ways. It can be used for modeling. A consecutive interpretation is provided for study. Consecutive interpretation practice or consecutive interpretation with a delay or a distractor task inserted between the end of the source and the beginning of the interpretation. In the event that consecutive interpretation of these materials is mastered, the speeches in their entirety can be used for practicing simultaneous interpretation.
to talk a little bit uh, right now about my experience with a particular tribe of Native American Indians that I spent some time with. Uh, these people are located in uh, southeastern Montana and they are called the Northern Cheyenne people. I'm currently uh, studying for my doctoral degree with the Union Institute in Ohio and as part of my studies I spent some time with the Northern Cheyenne people in Montana this past summer uh, from the week of June 30th to July 4th. As part of my studies, uh, we're required to attend three different sessions, uh, five-day seminars. And there's a listing that's provided of, of seminars throughout the United States, and this particular one caught my eye, and I thought it sounded intriguing. So I flew out to Montana, and on arrival there, I was amazed at how large uh, the nation is. The Northern Cheyenne people uh, have 144,000 acres in the southeastern uh, area of Montana State. During my five-day stay in Montana, I came to discover that there are many similarities between my culture and the culture of the Northern Cheyenne people. Um, one such instance was during a panel discussion uh, in which four Native American people shared their experiences uh, growing up. One panelist in particular talked about her experience in the educational system. Uh, within the boundaries of the reservation, there are three uh, schools for the Indian children. And um, this one particular panelist was talking about her school that uh, all the students there are Indians and this, the teachers are primarily uh, white Americans, which I was uh, immediately reminded of my experience um, going to a deaf residential school in which most of the teachers are hearing and there are very few uh, deaf teachers. So that was the first similarity that I, that I noticed between our two cultures. Another experience that the panelists spoke of um, 
I saw a lot of similarity was the the men in particular noted that when they first went into the school as young boys, their hair was long and was braided in the traditional manner of their people. But when they went to school, they were forced to have their hair cut in the way of American boys. Um, and one gentleman said that he was reminded of, of prisons where men have to have their heads shaved when they when they uh, go into the prisons. And that reminded me of the experience of deaf children, of being uh, physically uh, stopped from signing, having their hands slapped, and not being permitted to uh, express themselves in their, um, in their cultural way that they would, that they would typically do. And there's, uh, the gentleman on the panel talked about what a loss of identity it was for him to have his hair cut. And I could relate to that. In addition to our similar educational experiences in the past, I also see parallels in the way both of our educational systems are currently evolving. One woman on the panel uh, who works um, at the schools there talked about how in the past, in addition to the teachers being uh, Caucasian and American, they also taught predominantly about um, European American history and did not recognize uh, the Indian experience in this country, which um, also in my experience, we, we were not taught about uh, deaf history. But now there is an evolution towards bilingual, bicultural approach in the Indian schools, which is also happening in the deaf schools. And they are now uh, emphasizing um, the use of their first language, which unfortunately I don't remember the name of it, but they teach their first language in school and teach about their home culture, and then from that foundation work on uh, second language action and the broader culture that they live in, which is also the emphasis that is starting to come about in deaf education at the residential schools. During my visit with the Northern Cheyenne people, I was fortunate to meet uh, one deaf gentleman who is also um, a Native American. And he shared with me his experience um, identifying as a Northern Cheyenne and also identifying as a deaf person. And he did attend the Montana School for the Deaf, um, but has, has had to straddle those two cultures and, and get his cultural needs met um, the best he could. And on the reservation, there are only three or four other uh, deaf Indians. So what um, Alvin, his name is Alvin Birdhat, what he has done is he lives on the reservation, and then he commutes into town every so often to um, meet friends in the deaf community and, um, and spend some time with them. So in that way, he is able to um, keep his cultural roots as an Indian and also um, be able to meet with other deaf people.
When Alvin was sharing his experience with me, I was immediately reminded of a, another friend of mine who um, is also a deaf Native American, although from a different tribe, and he has, has chosen to do the same thing. He lives um, on the land of his nation, and then he commutes to spend time with other deaf people um, who are not Indians. So that was interesting. Another experience that, um, that I enjoyed very much was attending a powwow during my stay there. And at the powwow, the, it's a celebration where people from the tribe from all ages, children to, to the elders, gather together. And it's a time of celebration when um, they wear their ceremonial regalia and dance and um, share their culture. At the powwow, I picked up on another cultural parallel between deaf culture and Native, and this particular Native American culture, and that is that when the uh, the MC was introducing another Indian, uh, a guest who was visiting, uh, they introduced the guest by their full name first and last, and also uh, always noted where this person was from and a little bit about them. So. Uh, that's something that we do in deaf culture too when we're introducing somebody we we tend to give someone's full name and their residence and maybe a little bit of background information So, and in addition to the, the small similarities between our cultures, I also recognize that as um, deaf Americans have very fiercely held on to and preserved and passed on our culture to the children, likewise with the Northern Cheyenne people, they have uh, fiercely guarded their own culture and, and proudly passed it along to each generation. It was a wonderful experience and really made a, a, a significant impact on me.
not too long ago I purchased a condo, um, which I had no intention of doing. I surprised myself, and I'm going to tell you about how the purchase came about. I've been living in the D.C. metro area for the past 10 years, and during that time I've seen a lot of residences, houses, uh, townhouses, condos. I've talked to my, uh, some of my friends about their own purchases and just kind of gotten a feel for the market, what's out there, what, what uh, houses, you know, different kinds of residences are selling for these days, and just kind of checked out the whole market. And uh, during my travels around town, I've, I've gone to some uh, uh, open houses just to get an idea. And uh, I was on one particular uh, street that I was really taken by. And I didn't know if there was ever going to be anything for sale on the street that I could afford or if anything would ever come out of it. But this, this particular street stuck in my mind after I left the area. So I continued my window shopping or um, just attending open houses for the enjoyment of it to get an idea of the, the D.C. area and perhaps find a location that I would be interested in settling down someday. And um, I also would peruse the newspapers and, and see what was out there. And um, one day I noticed a, a, a condo for sale that was in the price range that I could afford. And I thought, hey, you never know. Take a look at it. Let's see. So I drove over to the address listed in the paper, and when I got there, I realized it was that street that I had been at some time before. It was the street that, that always stuck in my mind. So that was the first clue. And then when I went into the condo and looked around, it was a nice condo. I really liked it. So it started looking more and more like a real possibility. So I talked to the real estate agent and um, asked him, well, you know, what's the actual price that this condo is selling for? And he, he told me what the price was, he or she. And um, I said, well, you know, I, I could pay it, but it's a little more than what I wanted to pay. I said, you know, would you ask the owner if, if they'd be willing to take 10000 off the price? The real estate agent didn't think that was a very likely possibility, but said that they would, that they would give it a shot.
So I waited for, to hear back from the real estate agent, and um, finally they got back to me. And sure enough, the owner said they would be willing to take 10000 off the price. I couldn't believe it. So then I had to take a breath and think, well, this looks like this, really, this is really going to go. And not only that, interest rates were incredibly low. They were only 7.5%. And you know, for quite a while now, interest rates have been over 10%, 11 even 12%. And I didn't know, you know, where am I going to find a deal like this again? They took 10000 off the price. The interest rates are incredibly low. I don't know if I can pass this up. But the only thing is that at the same time, I was also um, in school studying for my doctors. So I really wasn't prepared to do this, but I decided I, I can't pass this up. So I said, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So once I made the big decision, then, we, then I had to, to uh, deal with the bank. So I got in touch with the bank, and they did an appraisal on the house, passed appraisal, and then they had to do a credit check, which I could not believe. Down to the very penny, these, these people checked my credit from like the past two or three years. They went through all my credit cards, my bills, everything. So I was going through the credit process, and everything was done. Everything had passed. I was all set to go except for my car loan. The bank said I had five months left on my car loan, and I had to pay the whole thing off in one, in one lump sum. So I added up what is five months of car payments, and it, it was a pretty big sum. And I, I didn't have that kind of money, so I got a hold of my mom and my sister, and you know my whole family helped out. and. I, I still didn't have enough. And I couldn't believe it. The real estate agent actually chipped in and even helped me make that payment. So I was able to pay off my car loan. So I got that taken care of, paid off my car, and everything was all set. The only thing was the owner still lived in the condo, so I had to wait for the owner to move out, which seemed to take forever. So finally, two months later, after from the initial viewing to the day I moved in, it was two months, and uh, my friends were great. They helped me take all my furniture over there and got me all moved in and settled and everything so I could get back to studies on my PhD. And I moved in, I had my condo, and I'm all through with my studies. It's all done.
Odd ball versus even ball. I'll never forget the last week of January. It was an incredible thing that happened to me. That was the week I found out I was pregnant. It was very difficult because I had a lot of pressures on me. I felt the expectations of everyone, my family, myself, my friends, society. It was very difficult. Just a few days later began uh, Black History Month, February, and I was the recipient of a scholarship. And I remember clearly sitting in the audience and hearing my name called and going up to the stage and just feeling the pressure of people's expectations and being a role model and what all that meant along with being pregnant. The month of March wasn't any better. That was the month that Gallaudet uh, established a new sorority called Delta Sigma Theta, which is an African American sorority nationwide. And I applied and I was accepted. And it was just another thing to, to bring that stress down on me and feel like I had so many things that I had to succeed in. And then in April, my pregnancy started showing, and I began to uh, attract looks from people as I walked around campus. And then in May, the school year was over, which was great, but then I had summer school that I had to take care of. Well, I got through the summer all right. September started the regular school year again and I came back to school even though my baby was due September 19th I came back to school I did everything everybody else did I walked around campus I went to all my classes and everything I had my baby at the end of September and in two weeks I was back in class Well, I kept at it through fall semester. I got through that, and then it was January. It had been a whole year since, uh, since I first found out I was pregnant. And in January, I um, had my son put in, in daycare. I had someone take care of him for the day so I could work on my studies. And I just kept working and working, knowing that I was going to graduate soon. That's what kept me going. And then, right at the end of the school year, again in May, my mother was in the hospital for three weeks, which was the worst timing because she helped me a lot with my son and she helped me keep my spirits up and just keep going and going so I could, so I could get through school. So that was difficult.
Finally, I was th she came home and she was back in the house again uh, for about a week and I really realized the things in life during that time with her. I was very close to graduating May 21st and tragedy struck our home. My mother had a car accident on May 18th and everything was in disarray, everything. But despite my mother's passing, I remembered what she had always told me, that to, to persevere and continue despite all odds, which is what I did. And after graduation, I felt like all the pressures of the world had been lifted off my shoulders, and I had succeeded. And now I look back on that experience, I really thank God for my mother being there for me. If she hadn't been without her support, I don't, I don't know if I could have made it. Gallaudet University recently and finally established a black sorority called Delta Sigma Theta. There had been pre previous attempts to uh, set up a sorority, but they were not successful. Delta Sigma Theta is the oldest black sorority in the United States. Um, there were, it was not successful in being uh, established here at Gallaudet University for various reasons, and uh, most of those were attributed to oppression. There were a few purposes to the founding of the sorority, um, the first of which was to keep up, try to keep up the student retention rate of black students at Gallaudet. Also, we wanted to um, keep our, our culture alive and out there, 
And we also wanted to work on um, recruiting more black students to the university. Uh, in addition, we also, the members of our sorority didn't want to be tokenized on campus, so having our own sorority helped that. And we also wanted to be um, a resource, an educational resource for the black community in general, uh, specifically uh, professionals working in hospitals, schools, various settings to educate the community about what our experience is as uh, black deaf women. So those are a few of the, the main reasons why we founded this sorority. Um, we felt like it was vital that our community be educated about what our experience is, and if we did not do that, that they may not get this information anywhere else and would continue to be unaware of, of our experience within the larger community.